Um, I'm guessing everyone braved Woodward right now, which is an absolute zoo. Um, my name is Chelsea Gallo, and I'm the cover conductor for your Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And I love doing these pre-concert talks. I absolutely love it. Um, and there's going to be a few references to previous lectures during this one. Did anyone come to our first concert of the season, Beethoven 5? Good, lots of relevant things happening in a bit. Did anyone come to the American Festival last year when our concert master, Kim Kennedy, played the Barber Violin Concerto? Wasn't that amazing? Okay, good. So if all of you could take out your syllabi. <laughs> Just teasing. Okay, so if everyone's okay with it, we're going to go through the program concert order, okay? And what you need to know about this first piece is how to pronounce the composer's name, okay? First name's Oti. Tarkiainen. Okay, I know you guys can roll your R's better than that. Tarkiainen. Oti Tarkiainen. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Um, the reason I know how to pronounce it is because our conductor for this week, John Storgards, is also Finnish and from the exact same part of Finland as Oti Tarkiainen, and so he taught me how to pronounce her name. And he, he's not only the person who commissioned this piece of music, but also to whom the piece is dedicated. And if you want an authority on this work, it's pretty much John Storsgaard. And you're going to have a firsthand experience of that this evening. Um, we, we have lots of pieces of music that talk about love and talk about death and talk about resurrection, but not many that talk about pregnancy or what it's like to be pregnant, obviously, because not a lot of pieces are written by women. Shocking. If a, if a man were to have, could you imagine, 1826, the year before he dies, Beethoven's like, this next tone poem, pregnancy. <laughs> so it's a really special time to be you know, commissioning music, hearing new music written by women and written on topics that just doesn't exist within our canon. So are you going to hear pregnancy in the piece? No. Are you going to hear giving birth in the piece? No. But what you're going to hear is the concept of her growing up in the Arctic Circle, Finland. You have it in very, very, very extreme north. So that means you have months and months and months in darkness, months and months and months in light. It's this overall concept of something that takes a long time to develop, to gestate, and then going back to how things were. Imagine being pregnant for all those months and there's no sunshine, or vice versa. You, I, it's an amazing concept, especially for, I mean, Detroit, it's pretty much the cold north for us, but not exactly the same. So she provided her own program note for you all, um, and you can read that, but what I like to do during these lectures is to give you information that you otherwise wouldn't have. And so the piece that most influenced Oti Tarkinen to write this one is by Jean Sibelius. We all remember the Fifth Symphony we did, we've done Finlandia, we've done lots of tone poems, violin concerto recently, and the piece that really spoke to her was called Tapiola. And I think, I think she talks about that in the program note. But what exactly is it about Tapiola that speaks to her, relates to her? The piece opens with these cascading flourishes, almost like snow flurries in the winds, these descending rapid fire scales from the piccolo to the flute and the bassoon. And then you have this almost water-like mm, pond of string players underneath, and it all happens on top. This is not a new concept for Sibelius. Almost all of his mu music um, is in nature, and that's something that she, uh, Oti, copies within this piece. But Tapiola takes it a little farther than Sibelius Violin Concerto or Sibelius V or Sibelius II, or these more tonal pieces. Tapiola goes into a crunchier, a more dissonant type of place. And this is the, pi this is the part of Tapiola that Oti most drew from. <laughs> You hear how there are very unclear rhythms happening in the string section, how everything's a little bit disjointed. That's also an aspect that you're going to find in this first piece. So we're gonna try something together, and I'm going to evacuate this idea if it doesn't work the first time, but let's give it a shot, okay? We're going to learn how to play five against two, okay? Okay, so we're gonna do bump, 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 two to a beat, and then we're gonna do three to a beat, bop, 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 
And then we're gonna see what happens when I ask you to do five to two beats, okay? We're gonna go two to a beat, three to a beat, and five. So we can think about it, four, six, five. Okay, ready? And five, five. Okay, 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 okay. Fa, 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 fa. And so just, I know this is gonna come up at your dinner parties where, oh, you can't do five against two, let me teach you, okay. You need to subdivide five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and then only do the odd numbers. One, three, five, seven, nine, one, three, five, seven, nine. Okay? Okay? So we're gonna count to 10, and then we're only gonna do the odd numbers, okay? One, and. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, wait, wait. Once again, wait. <laughs> Once again, here we go. And. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, three, five, seven, nine. One, three, five, seven, nine. Hey, yeah, good. Fantastic. So here's where it gets the next step harder. The first violins will do that, and then the second violins will also do that, but disjointed by an eighth note. So it's really 20 pulses to a bar. Isn't that great? Oh, you guys are such good musicians. This is going to be such a great concert talk. Okay. At this point, I've spoke about as long as the piece lasts, so we need to move on. <laughs> and next up is the Barber Cello Concerto, which is unreal. This is a masterwork, and often it doesn't get programmed for um, very clear reasons. First of all, it takes an amazing orchestra to play it. It's incredibly difficult. There are constant meter changes, tempo changes, uh, key changes, a lot of rubato. The soloist has the extraordinary difficult um, job of creating music out of these double stops, these dissonances, these crazy pizzicato moments. And so you have to have an unreal cellist, which we have tonight, Elisa Weilerstein, next level talent. We're so lucky that she's here with us. And then you need a great orchestra, which these guys can play. Yeah. So why, so that's pretty much why the cello concerto often doesn't get programmed as much as the violin concerto, which came before it, and the piano concerto, which comes later. But this is a very special time in Samuel Barber's life when he writes this cello concerto. You know, I know how you guys love it when I give like, you know, fun little facts about the composers. So um, if anyone wants to write these down for their next dinner party, <laughs> Samuel Barber wrote his first opera at 10 years old. His upstairs neighbor when he was living in Manhattan was clarinetist Benny Goodman. And in 1942, he joined the Army Air Corps. He was a soldier. You know, he was just an American kid, and he became a soldier, and it was while he was en enlisted that he received the commission for his second symphony. And it was also around this time, this period of compositional excellence, 1939 to 1949, when he developed this very specific sound. During this time period, you have the cello concerto, but you also have incredible works like Barbara Knoxville, Summer of 1915, which is my favorite piece of American music. It's unreal. If you haven't listened to it, check out the Kathleen Battle recording. She's all talent. Um, but why does Barber sometimes get overlooked when you talk about, oh, amazing composers, everyone's like Beethoven and Mahler and Bruckner. Okay, no one says Bruckner except me. Um, but why not Barber? It's a weird time period for American classical music, this World War II era. You get the European system coming out of, out of romanticism and then out after the, epitom the epitomizing symphonies of Mahler. You know, it's after that. They've moved into serialism. They've moved on to... Uh, more dissonance, more uh, creating new styles of music, not just individual voices. And then Samuel Barber sometimes gets referred to as, you know, this old school romanticism, not updated with the times. But that's just not true. And if anyone tells you that at these dinner parties, tell them to stop it, okay? Because this is how the third movement of the cello concerto begins. That was a 12-tone row, and what I mean by that is um, there was a second Viennese school of composition, uh, Schoenberg, Berg, uh, Weber, and this was a type of serialism where you would use 12 tones, all 12 tones, in a specific co coordinated way, twist it around, retrograde it, invert it, and then develop an entire piece around this cell of ideas. And Barber, the guy who's, you know, people are saying, oh, he's just ultra romanticism, just introduced the finale of his cello concerto with a 12-tone row. Okay, so first of all, that's pretty revolutionary. We need to go back to talking about how the military existence he was experiencing may have influenced this piece. 
Now, this isn't fact, but it's something that I think, and I just want to share it with you all. You know, when we were talking about Beethoven 5, or when we talked about Beethoven 9, or what did we, or when we were talked about Mozart 5, the Turkish uh, violin concerto, we always talk about military bands. And part of military bands, an aspect of them, is the percussion music, the percussion instruments that accompany them. And so a snare drum's pretty militaristic, don't you think? And he chooses to use one in the first movement of his symphony. And this, and this is important because this piece, written in 1945, military comparison. So here is, tr try to listen for the snare drum specifically in the first movement. <laughs> Did you hear it? I'm going to play a different piece of music for you, and I want you to tell me if it sounds at all familiar to what you just heard. What was that? That sounds kind of similar. That piece, that piece was written uh, eight years before Barbara's cello concerto, and there's no chance Barbara knew that piece of music, and that's Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. The piece that when we think about military music, especially if it's military symphonic music, Shostakovich Five comes to mind. And so those two pieces sound incredibly similar, don't they? Well, no, no, no. Those two musical moments sound similar, don't they? Big distinction. And this, this idea of how the military affected him and how you know, the idea of a new world coming forth, World War I, World War II, and now what is about to happen, 1945. Um, like Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, the first movement gives way to an incredibly cantabile, minor, m more morose music. And so this is how, this is how the slow movement in Shostakovich V begins. No one's about to say that was jovial or triumphant, right? And this is the second movement of Barber's Cello Concerto. Now, I'm not saying that either of them had this in mind. I'm not saying that um, the piece from 1945 was inspired by the piece from 1937. In fact, it's not possible. We know for a fact that he never heard Shostakovich V. But fu another fun fact, Samuel Barber was the first American po composer to go to the Soviet Union during the 20th century. Um, but maybe there's a chance that these composers that were inundated with, with uh, war and having to enlist in the military, watching their loved ones be taken away by the military, maybe they subconsciously created within their compositions a ratio of military marching, uh, literal translation of their experiences, there's a ratio of that to the actual lyricism, inward looking music that usually follows that type of projection. This is not a fact, I'm just, think ask, I'm just telling you so that maybe you take that bit of information forward with you to your next concert attendance and think about the next piece that has military values. Okay, and now a piece that you've never heard of, that you've never even listened to by an obscure composer, Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. This work is revolutionary. It's it, it, it was an absolute departure from so many aspects of Beethoven's works. Like just to list a few characteristics about it, it's his only symphony in five movements. Um, it's the uh, only symphony that uses a 12-8 meter for a movement, except the Ninth Symphony, but only for like 16 bars, so it doesn't really count. Um, other than the Fifth Symphony and just portions of the Ninth Symphony, the use of trombones, of extended timpani use, the piccolo, um, how he separates the cellos and Divisi sections. It's absolutely amazing. The number one thing about this symphony compared to the others is how he gives it a title. He gives every, every movement a specific title. Did Beethoven write a tone poem?
kind of. But at the same time, is this minimalism? Also kind of. And at the same time, is this supreme romanticism? Also, yes, this piece is absolutely revolutionary. It also occurred on the same absolutely massive program in December of 18, uh, 1808, where the Fifth Symphony was premiered, the Choral Fantasy was premiered, a couple songs were premiered, the Fourth um, Piano Concerto and the Fifth Symphony. Could you imagine 1808 Vienna, December, there is no heat. You have to sit there for a four hour concert. The prince is totally asleep in his box and you have to sit there because Beethoven's like, you're all going to love this. It was an absolutely massive concert experience, which I'm glad none of you will ever have to sit through. Like we all love Beethoven, but that's a lot of Beethoven. Um, another fun fact on that program, Beethoven's fifth, which we know bum, 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 was listed as a sixth and vice versa. When people talk about the Sixth Symphony, it often goes in tandem with the Fifth Symphony for a couple different reasons. First of all, it starts off in the same meter and kind of with the same idea. You get three eighth notes that introduce an idea. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba 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 this descending third figure, ba -da -da -dum. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -bum. it permeates throughout the entire Sixth Symphony. You'll, you'll hear little associations throughout the entire thing. But the most important thing to know with the Sixth Symphony is the program that goes along with it. He literally paints for you different scenes. If you had comparable paintings from early 19th century Austria, you would know exactly what he's doing. The second movement is an introduction to sitting by a, a brook, like a lazy river, and he literally writes the water. <laughs> Does it sound like water? One of the great, one of the one of my favorite aspects about this piece comes at the end of the second movement. He writes in these bird calls, and we know that they're literally bird calls because he specifies that this is a quail, this is a cuckoo. Also, to take you back to the very first piece on the program, it ends with a bird call, a trill in the concert master. So um, keep an ear out for that. He, these are the bird calls in Beethoven's <laughs> that great and so you get the, you get these beautiful moments the first movement this introduction to a you know a shepherd's day and then the second movement enjoying enjoying life next to a river and then you get this third movement which is it's pretty much a peasant dance So dur during that movement, you can almost picture everything. And so when we talk about this piece being ahead of its time, he's writing you little, little miniatures. If anyone came to La Mer last week, Debussy wrote you the ocean. But this was, that was so much later than Beethoven writing the Sixth Symphony. When you think about other composers that do things, or like Debussy with clouds, or any, any composer, people who create actual paintings, like Mazursky, Ravel, with pictures at an exhibition, literally telling you verbatim what those pictures are. Beethoven's doing it so much uh, earlier than they are. During the performance, it's going to seem like it's not five movements, because the last three movements are a taka. So once the dance starts, the next thing your job is to do, other than listen and enjoy, is to clap after about 25 minutes, okay? It just goes, which, honestly, if you just took that, if you just took movements three, four, five, that's your piece of music, and you put that in 1808, and not call it a symphony, just call it a shepherd's day, that would be, that would have, oh my gosh. He would be such a famous composer if he would have done that. But like, like most uh, afternoon festivities, sometimes a storm comes and ruins the day.
everyone has a seat where they actually get to watch our timpanist play this, this movement. It's the most amazing thing you'll see. Plus getting to watch our bass section do these acrobatics up and down the neck to create this storm and drong type of atmosphere. It's amazing. It's incredibly specific orchestration. Everything has a purpose. Our piccolo player has 16 notes, but Beethoven specifically wrote them. At one point, when the piccolo is playing, it's a, it's a high E flat. It's the largest orchestration in the entire piece, and it happens during the storm. Now, I don't want you to be sitting there and be like, hey, that's what she was talking about. Did you hear the range? Seven and a half octaves. Oh my gosh. That's no. <laughs> but after, this, this, after the storm, then comes an absolutely beautiful plaintive melody. Pretty much of thanks to have survived the storm. And then at the end of this movement is, is my favorite part. It's literally a, a peasant hymn or, or a peasant prayer, thank, thanking the gods for sparing them during the storm. Isn't that great? Oh, so beautiful. Who was inspired by this piece? So many people. So many people took this piece after hearing it and created their own compositions. It changed how we viewed symphonic form. It, it was strange for Beethoven because after this, his seventh and eighth symphonies actually returned to a much more classical style. The seventh symphony with a slow introduction, and then the eighth symphony, his shortest symphony, being a very normal four movement structure. But there was one composer after Beethoven, last name also starts with a B, um, who was obsessed with this piece. Like, he wrote an essay about it. He uh, often quoted it in his treatise about orchestration and symphonic playing, and that was Hector Berlioz. Did anyone come to Symphony Fantastique last week, two weeks ago? Fantastic. So here's the thing. Good composers steal. It means they have taste and they know what to take and they know how to change it just a little bit. So you have, we have the start of the fifth movement. Bum, 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 bum. Oh my God. <coughs> bum, 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 bum. It's just a triad, it's, ju it's just a chord, right? But who else writes a pastoral theme? And who else uses that idea? Berlioz in Symphony Fantastique. Scene au champ, uh, scene on the fields. Bum, 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 bum. Verbatim. Also, each time it's present, it's F major or C major. But the reason Berlioz gets away with it, bum, 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 bum. you add that little neighbor tone, and suddenly it's your own piece. We, should, we could do a whole concert talk about good composers who steal. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying there's a film composer who did that with that one movie about space. <laughs> but maybe. 1808, 1807, do not think that Beethoven was fully deaf at, the, deaf at this point, because he wasn't. His, he was completely deaf more around 1816. But of course, we all know he started losing his hearing 1802, 1803, around the time he wrote the Heiligenstadt Testament. It changed his, it changed his life. He, he, couldn't grapple, he couldn't handle the fact that he knew God had given him this talent to write music, and then he was taking away his hearing. But... When you think about someone living in 1806, 1807, 1808, what would be the loudest thing they would hear? It's not an Aerosmith concert. It's not a 737. Other than a cathedral being built or a military cannon, church bells, it's not, it's not that, well, the church bells are up there, but it's not, there's not that many things that are that loud. And so when we get to the storm tonight and you hear how loud it is, Disclaimer, we have a bigger, a bigger string section than Beethoven had by about, in total, maybe about 15 players, but still very loud. And he was the premier composer at the time. So all that's just to say that he kind of was like a literal rock star, just saying. Okay, we only have a 
Okay, we have a few minutes left, and I always like to leave some time for questions. If anyone has them about anything on the program this evening. Yes. The question was, was Rossini's William Tell Overture after the Sixth Symphony? It, um, I don't know. I don't know, but we can Google it in the lobby later. Oh, also, I always go to the lobby after these talks, so if, you have any, if, you come, if you're too shy and you don't want to ask your question now, but you should ask it now. Anyone else? Yeah. No, not that it wasn't known. There was no way that Barber had heard it. There was no way that Samuel Barber had heard before 1945 Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. Any other questions? You guys, you know I do this, so like, Really? Okay. Enjoy your minute and a half of freedom. Thank you.